Good evening. I call to order the work session for the Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners for February 6, 2012. Um, Commissioner White is running just a few minutes late. He'll join us momentarily. Uh, before you, Commissioners, you have the work session agenda. At this time, I would accept a motion to approve the work session agenda as presented. So moved. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we're going to start today with our discussion items that will require no action on our part um, for this meeting or for next week. Uh, first up, as always, the uh, QZAB projects. Will Crabtree is unable to be with us today, but we do have Lynn Whitkey here from Cabarrus County Schools. Hey, Lynn. <laughs> Madam Chair and Commissioners, um, let me bring you up to speed on things. We have been busily bidding things, and I will say it, uh, it's, uh, it's been fruitful. The, um, the majority of our projects that we recently bid are um, technology projects, and for the most part, uh, they have been coming in within budget. Uh, in the case of uh, the most recently, pro and I don't, I don't know if I brought that with me, I say with the, we, we bid two projects just last week, and both of those projects came in within, uh, within budget. Those were the, uh, the middle schools, the two middle schools that we had to do. So overall, I think we have two remaining technology projects that we're still working on. Those will be bid next month, or I'm sorry, later this month. Um, and so that, that will sort of round out the technology work uh, for the time being. The other projects uh, that we're getting ready to bid are some of the controls projects for the uh, um, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning uh, systems. Uh, if you recall, we bid the chiller work, which is being worked on right now at a number of schools, and we're preparing to bid the controls work that will actually uh, go in starting in late spring and summer. So we'll probably work pretty much throughout the entire summer period in those schools uh, to get them ready for fall and for the heating, well, cooling and heating seasons uh, as we go forward. So all of the projects are doing well. Um, we. Uh, we do have one project uh, that, uh, due to a um, couple of things that happened at Northwest High School, the gymnasium project um, is because of, of uh, an increase in costs in, in the application of certain codes, uh, specifically sprinkler, ADA, and, um, and exiting. The uh, cost of that project has risen and in looking at it, uh, the uh, board has decided that they would prefer to go in a different direction uh, with the design. So at this point in time, what we've been instructed to do is, is have our design team work to develop a project uh, that would be more in compliance with the existing codes and the application of the codes, and also that would uh, ideally drop the bleachers down to the main floor level in the gymnasium, and that would allow cross-court play within the gym. It would still maintain the, or still would have a part of the project as the addition of 500 new beds, new beds, excuse me, new seats. <laughs> that, that's a, an old, an old uh, project I used to work on, excuse me, new, new seats, so that all of the seating would be at the same level, whereas now, you may recall there's there's a gymnasium floor and then the, the walls go up for about six feet and then there's a level at which the seating is is occurring that's both both a hazard to play as well as difficulty when it comes to ada accessibility and even sight lines in some cases so the decision was that uh, we would we would at least design the project to modify the school's uh, gymnasium uh, to be the best that it can be given its physical constraints. Uh, it does look like we'll be over budget and that's something that we're gonna have to deal with as we get into the uh, bidding process. Uh, but our board has, has asked us to at least get the contract documents to the point where we can get realistic estimates on the costs and address the, uh, the over cost, overruns on budget at that time. Any questions? Any questions? Excuse me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the other uh, document that you have in front of you, I'll just point out, is the, um, the budget update or budget status for the projects. And 
the only changes that we've made so far in this are on the second page. They're identified in yellow. Um, yes, thank you. And that's where we were moving some of the dollars between projects that uh, had uh, sufficient funds to cover projects that ran a, a little bit over. And in, in all cases, again, keeping within the IT projects themselves, we were able to cover any costs that came in over. And as I say, the two most recently bid projects, which were Mount Pleasant and uh, Northwest Middle Schools, both of those projects came in within, bu within uh, budget. Any other questions? Any questions? Okay. And we'll have you back up in a little bit for yes, an action item. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Anna Yan with uh, PBH to do a presentation of the 2011 second quarter dashboard report. Great to have you here today. Good afternoon. So before you have the second quarter of the fiscal year reporting of county funds and as well as looking at some of the Medicaid funds, with that we're looking at 90, about almost 95% reporting of the county funds for the first six months. That is usually a claims lag. Um, they have 90 days to bill PBH, so you're looking at that 95%. As well as below in the graph, some of those numbers that are going down, you may also see that because of a claims lag, but that pretty much holds steady. For innovations, that stays steady in, typically in April is where the state looks to provide additional funding for innovation. So you'll see those numbers decrease going into usually the fourth quarter. For the residential registry of unmet needs, that has also stayed steady. Although there are vacancies within the counties, they may be choosing to wait for a particular setting. For AD ADVP, which is your adult day vocational programming, that has the registry has increased. You see that go down usually in the first of the fiscal year and then increase steadily as those funds are depleted. For number of consumers served, for your outpatient, 64% is consumer served within that budget. And the expense amount, innovations, which is a very costly service for individuals that choose community placement instead of institutional setting. So you see outpatient, which is a lower cost service, much higher numbers with the expense of innovations being the highest cost. The next graph defines distinct numbers of individuals served through Medicaid funding community services in the emergency department in this past fiscal year additional codes were added for behavioral health so you won't see the reporting for last fiscal year but this year you'll start seeing that reporting of funds being expended for emergency department services the numbers have have increased over the last year for C waiver recipients that's your innovations at the very bottom for the graph. The numbers have stayed steady, as I stated. Uh, funding usually doesn't come in until the fourth quarter. But the cost of those services, implementation of a project called the Support Needs Matrix at looking at needs, balancing uh, funding, we've seen that funding gradually decrease, um, although we've been able to serve the same amount. The last page just shows the top 10 providers of Cabarrus County, the numbers of individuals in Cabarrus County that have been supported, and then the total paid claims for the providers in this area. And then as well as you see detailed services by providers and the number of actual individuals that they've served within that quarter. 
Any questions? Commissioners, or Commissioner Carruth, do you have anything you want to add? And this is outside the realm of just the quarterly dashboard, but you know, this discussion is still going on about how the governance will be set up for the new organization because it will include the five counties that are traditionally been considered PBH, the five counties that are now five county uh, LME, Orange Person, Chatham, and Alamance Caswell. So we will, once it's uh, the mergers are complete, the organization, which will be known as Cardinal Innovations, will stretch all the way from basically the uh, Mecklenburg County line all the way to the Virginia State line along pretty much along the I-85 corridor, except for a couple of gaps in there, but uh, and will serve a huge population throughout the state. Will will be the largest LME in the state. So they're trying to sort out how that's going to work out, though, because the to try to keep a local flavor of PBH, but at the same time not have uh, 40 people on the board of directors. So <laughs> that's all we fleshed out. So you'll have your work cut out for you when you have to go around and do these reports <laughs> for well, all the different counties. Yeah. I will just be located within uh, the five counties of the original PBH to keep that so that I will be able to go out to the counties. <laughs> yeah, the way it's, it's going to kind of work is the Anna will have the, each one will maintain their own identity. And there will be like a district operations. And so it will be uh, that way you they'll maintain contact with the local boards in that area. So. Do we have a, I mean, you're our representative mm -hmm. towards their board. Do we have an alternate for you? No, because there's not a, it's an appointed position that's different than some of the other committees that we serve on as liaisons. So I am the appointed person. So if I'm not there, then no one else can substitute for me as far as a board member is concerned. We may want to, um, Commissioner Burridge and Commissioner Meesmer, um, we may want to look at, at somebody going with, Commissioner Carruth to a couple of the meetings between now and uh, the end of the year to get some familiarity. So if either of you are interested in that, we might need to, I wouldn't say every month. We, um, we do have but a, we, once or a couple times so you can get a better understanding that because come December, obviously there'll have to be a change. So we take and a you break. You mentioned that to me. Yeah, we take a break usually in July and August the meetings. And, uh, but we do have a board retreat coming up in April, third week, third Thursday in April. And um, then, like I say, September is kind of when we start the board starts back its board year. So that may be a good opportunity those two th meetings to be available if you're interested in you want to be interested in serving and taking my place when I leave. So, all right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Next up, we have uh, Jonathan Marshalls is, is here to talk about um, the history, I guess, behind. Um, transfer the transfer of Lake Howell to Wasac, and also want to recognize Coleman Keeters over here with Wasac. In fact, I was going to invite Coleman to come up in case there were any questions that he could respond to better than I could. Just to introduce this item, um, back in 1997, Cabarrus County Commissioners entered into an agreement with the Water and Sewer Authority to operate and maintain Lake Howell and the dam structure for us. Um, in that agreement, one of the whereases says, whereas the county believes it will be in the best interest of the citizens of Cabarrus County for Wasac to operate, maintain, and own the reservoir, so to actually own the property. We've been operating kind of under the idea that that, that, would not, that transfer would not take place until the debt service was retired for the lake and its construction. Well, that will happen this March. So I had brought this forward both to the Water and Sewer Authority Board for discussion, and I'm bringing it to this board for discussion. Just merely to get your direction for staff on how you'd like for us to pursue this or if you'd like for us to pursue this uh, moving forward with the transfer of that that property um, again we have the existing operating and maintenance agreement that will continue but this is simply a, a question of uh, is there some interest in the transfer of that property to the to the water and sewer authority okay. coleman do you want to give us some Background, why would, is Wasac interested in the transfer? I mean, I know it's in the document. What is your opinion about it? Have, yeah, uh, well, we, we already, you know, operate and maintain, and, and this is a uh, longstanding agreement. It certainly predates my coming to uh, Wasac. Uh, it's, it works really well uh, as it is. We, uh, we 
And our operations is ma and maintenance is paid for by uh, other municipalities who are our customers. And the vast majority of that falls on to the cities of uh, Concord and Kannapolis right now. They basically pay for the operation and maintenance and we actually uh, make sure it happens. It's not a tremendous amount of, of maintenance, but uh, there is, you know, some mechanical things out there, the spillways, the dam itself, and that sort of thing, which we uh, include in our budget each year. Uh, my understanding was, and, uh, and uh, take some of this with a grain of salt because it predates my existence here, the first one to do this was in uh, either 2009 or 2010, and there was some refinancing of some bonds. And so those come to you now in 2012, and uh, it is just uh, the next window or existing window to make those uh, transfers possible. There is a, a sort of a two-pronged thing. There is some uh, uh, asset swapping issues, and we'd have to let our attorneys look at that uh, and, and just look at the contract, make sure we are meeting the full terms and conditions of the operational agreement. So it's basically, uh, if y'all would like for us to pursue that through through your, your administrative folks and through our administrative folks, and we could come back and tell you what we have found, and hopefully there's the issues there, and then it's just a matter of deciding if you would like to proceed or if there are reasons you would not like to proceed. Questions? Will the county have any authority over this, Patrick, if it's uh, passed over to them? If once we transfer the property, as far as how it operates, no, there would not be any, it would be solely owned and operated by WASAC. The county uh, would no longer have any responsibility for it either, right? That is correct. However, we do have positions on the on the WASAC board yeah. that would have some, some uh, say so in how, what the future of the operations are. Yeah, we have two positions on the WASAC board. I think there's a provision in that document that does um, give the Board of Commissioners the right to approve whether it's transferred to a third party. Right. There appears to be a provision in, in there to that effect. So if, say if it were transferred to WASAC, I think they'd have to come back if they contemplated transferring <coughs> it to a third party to get approval of this board. I guess that leads me to my question and I think, you know, it's part of the history of this whole thing back when it was original when WASAC was originally formed I believe that we we were kind of put in there that we would look when our debt service was retired on the reservoir that we would review whether the assets would be turned over to WASAC but wasn't it also provision for city of Kannapolis and Concord when their water systems as well at some point in the future that they were would also be faced with the same decision to make or there is some language in the agreement that Again, there's some question. It, this is just about the same time that we were transferring our water and sewer assets to the different municipalities and them transferring some assets to the county. So there was some, in the agreement, it says transfer of ownership of the reservoir from the county to Wasac will be within 90 days subsequent to the transfer of water and sewer facilities by the municipalities within Cabarrus County. When the collective book value is said water and sewer facilities are equal to the book value of the reservoir. So there is it was contemplated that there would be additional transfers of assets from the cities and and, and really be more of a true water and sewer authority mm -hmm. um, and in fact i think we need to look back at those agreements and transfers as as part of this contemplation to see what they what those different agreements said and what was what they foresaw in terms of the value of those assets i, I think that's what mr Keter is talking about there's some there's some other language in there that mm -hmm. if you guys are of the opinion that we want to move forward with making this transfer then then there are some other background work that we need to produce uh, talk with our attorneys about to mm -hmm. either change the language or if, or if we're going to move forward with the current language to make sure it's 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 legal because I believe in all the stuff that we've went through in the last 10 years I think that one of the things that was would be contemplated was that eventually the WASAC would become the single water and sewer utility for the entire county uh, or have a major portion of that. I know on the wastewater side, everything is working really great the way it's set up now. Um, but 
you know, how would the water on the water side? That's something that's never really. I mean, as we know, because we've been involved in some issues in the past. But um, you know, that I would say before we go and say we definitely we would turn it over is that we would, what we would say is is that we want to pursue what all else would have to be reviewed and looked at, kind of a due diligence to see what it would take to, if we decided to turn it over and what we, what would. Yes, Concord and Canapolis be compelled to do as well at that point in time, if anything, in the agreement. And then have it, it may have to have a, I mean, it's been, what, 20 years since WASAC was formed? 15, 20 years? Is it something that we need to have a discussion between the two, you know, between the, the 20 years, you know, the two cities and <coughs> counties? Is it something else we need to come back together and have a further discussion about what we want to do? I mean, that's. Well, and this is not, a, we're, we have this on here just to bring it up as, as an information mm -hmm. item. It's not here for any action on our parts tonight. Um, it is part of the contract, and the WASAC board began discussing it, and that was why I wanted to give Jonathan a chance to, uh, Bob and I both sit on the WASAC board, so we're more familiar with it, but I want to make sure everybody was familiar with um, the possibility of the transfer, unless you see anything glaringly that, you know, you don't want to even investigate it, then at this point I would suggest that, that staff, Jonathan, Rich, everybody uh, might look into the contract in detail, try to get a more extensive report for us, make sure what the legalities are, is there anything involving the two major, uh, major cities of Concord and Kannapolis, and what that would look like. Um, and I, what's the time frame? I mean, there's, there is a certain time frame that this would have to happen. Um, at this point, we brought it up because, again, we thought it was triggered by, at least the contemplation of it was triggered by the, the retirement to that debt, but there really isn't a time frame. There's nothing binding in there. Mm -hmm. So we would just, okay. we would start going through the information, looking at that, what was contemplated with that book value statement, and then just bring you back the information. I mean, WASAC is operating it now. Um, so it's not like that's going to change. It's not like we're currently operating and we would mm -hmm. be turning over the yes. operation to another entity. Um, and WASAC has um, done a good job, I think, handling um, everything that they're doing. Um, so you know, my suggestion would be that we at least have staff further investigate it, come back and see if it is something that we, we want to look at in more detail or get details on so that we can make a decision. We yeah. may decide to do nothing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it would be good to you know look at the information, I, I think, you know, clearly there's a lot more information, you know, that we need to know about it, but <clears throat> I don't see an issue with that. If, if the property's turned over to WASAC, they'll have full liability for the property. And, um, I mean, if they're currently operating, I don't, I don't I see that foreseeing that be an issue. Um, yeah, you currently have liability yeah. on the property uh, too. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, if, if I may add just for everybody's information over the past few years, we have increased the buffer around the lake. And WASAC has done that out of partially out of grant money, partially out of our funds, uh, to make sure we protect the watershed as well as we can, and that is our intention in the future because uh, uh, Lake Howell is is the most important utility infrastructure in the county. How, how much was the debt service payment that will retire you? I don't recall, and I, I would hate to put Susan on the spot. That I don't yeah. think she has that either okay. off the top of her head. I'd just be we interested find, to know. We can get that information to you. There, we can get that. Um, any other questions as far as the reservoir goes? Commissioner White, I know you just, just got here. Did you have any questions on WASAC? Okay, <laughs> no problem. Um, a short digression, but since you're here, do you want to say anything about the other major WASAC project that uh, you're in the middle of? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting project. Uh, <laughs> we are we are basically at uh, at the uh, Rocky River plant, and uh, we are in in the beginning phases of a heat recovery energy production project. Uh, it's it's very innovative. Uh, it is uh, garnering a lot of attention nationally, and we are going to at the end of this project be able to produce about 1.5 2 megawatts of electric power back across the grid and the uh, the primary source of fuel for this is, is wastewater treatment plant residuals uh, 
prior to this project, they have all been lost. The heat has always been lost to atmosphere, and we're capturing the heat and uh, going to a generator. And uh, we get uh, tipping fees for sludge coming in, and we also uh, get remunerated for the electricity that we produce. So hopefully, and we feel very strongly that it's going to be a success. Uh, anybody wants to come visit, I'd like to extend that. It's a, it's a large hole, part of what's going on right now. But if you give it a couple months, some stuff will uh, uh, start popping up down there, and it'll be a very informative tour if anyone would like to uh, take advantage of that. You have, uh, just let us know anytime. They have an incinerator. We're, Wasac was unique in having an incinerator already. So um, due to his leadership and the, um, all the staff, they've come up with a way to kind of maximize usage of the facility. Yes, ma'am. And should be beneficial to everybody, so. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right, next up we have uh, discussion items for action at our next meeting. And the first thing that we have, uh, Lynn Whitkey is still here to come back up uh, to discuss uh, Cabarrus County Schools request for extension of the deadline for funding several projects from the last COPS. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Just to, there we go, thank you. Just to bring everybody up to speed on that, on, on this whole issue. When we have done the COPS projects, uh, these were basically four brand new schools. There were two elementary schools, two middle schools, uh, of which you supported us and we strongly appreciate that, that effort. We used COPS funding to do those schools and uh, we had some funds available when they were completed uh, to address needs that, you know, to the best way of explaining it, were simply not addressed in the original design of the, of the schools themselves. Uh, this was everything from uh, mailboxes to uh, uh, basketball standards to a whole host of small, uh, what we call out outbuildings that are needed to uh, typically uh, provide storage for flammable materials like gasoline for for a um, uh, generator or a uh, not excuse me not a generator but a lawnmower uh, to. Uh, shades structures for our um, slides on the elementary schools. So I guess I wasn't, I wasn't part to, party to the design process, so I guess I can point to that and say um, we, we've learned some lessons in, in going forward. Uh, we would obviously include all of these things in the next projects that we would do because they are a necessary part of, of the schools that we build. Uh, they unfortunately were left out of the original program requirements and the county worked with us to find a way to get us uh, monies to, to build the projects out of the COPS funding. The list that you see in front of you is the very last or tail end portion of those projects. They were very numerous to start with. They've, we've, we've got them down to a fairly manageable few, um, but I think that in reality uh, the the construct of, of meeting the, the February 28th deadline for all and every one of the last remaining projects is just not possible for us to achieve. And there are reasons for this. It, it's everything from uh, my taking on new roles and, and diversifying my time commitments throughout the last nine months of this year, uh, this fiscal year, uh, have, have certainly taken me away from, from a focus on some of this. At the same time, there were other issues. There, there were delays in terms of completing some of the aspects of the projects, the initial school projects, which delayed us from doing some of the, what we call additional project work. One example of that was the ponds at AT Allen, which took almost a year beyond occupancy of the building to get it right by the contractor. And until we were able to get it right, we were not able to design a solution to an outflow problem that we're having with a neighboring property. So it's those sorts of issues that have, have caused delays. Uh, we, we have um, recently, because of, as you know, our warm temperatures in the summer, we've been, um, it's been brought to our attention that, that slide temperatures 
uh, at times can exceed 140 degrees uh, due to the exposure to direct sunlight. So we've come up with shade structures uh, that you, you are beginning to see pop up at the elementary schools uh, to protect the slides specifically. And, you know, someone said, well, wouldn't, wouldn't trees be better? And I, I agree wholeheartedly, but when you start out with cleared sites without any trees left to work with, it's difficult. So we found that the shade structures do provide that measure of safety to cool the slides, keep them at a temperature that the children could safely use them. The difficulty with us bidding this work on the slides, for example, were that there was a uh, difference of opinion on what code applied. The manufacturers of the slide uh, excuse me, of the um, uh, shelters uh, insisted that the, the newest code, which was 2006 International Building Code, uh, was what they were building to and that was what was accepted nationally. Our local code officials uh, did not feel that was appropriate, so we sort of went back and forth and eventually worked that out, but it, it was a delay of several weeks uh, going through that process. We, we worked through that, we did bid them. They are waiting for delivery, or, or they're being manufactured right now with delivery scheduled for the first part of March. Uh, none of these projects, um, save perhaps the, um, the stormwater um, mitigation on, on the A.T. Allen property and also the resolution of uh, the uh, purchase of land or at least the negotiation on, on the use of land with Mr. Alexander at the Patriots School site are probably things that may take a bit longer. Uh, there is a, I can take you to there, the project at uh, Hickory, excuse me, at um, H. E. Winkler Middle School. And in that particular instance, we're uh, going to be going to mediation next week on an issue where we did road improvements at that school. We offered payment for the land that we had to use to improve the roads per DOT requirements and the owner uh, refused to accept that sum and has asked us to join them in mediation, which we've agreed to do. So that part of it will be resolved hopefully next week. Um, the two change order items for electrical work on storage buildings are underway at this time and we believe those will be completed uh, by the end of this week or early next week. So for all intents and purposes, things are coming down to a, a handful of leftover items that we're working on, and we're asking the commissioner's uh, support and generosity, I guess, in terms of giving us a time extension. I've asked till June 1st, just in case something comes up with a mediation issue or with something that I cannot foresee, but clearly our goal is to resolve all of these as quickly as possible. Questions? How long has Patriots Elementary? How long has Patriots Elementary been open? Approximately a year. Year, year and a half. Year and a half. Excuse me. So year and a half. This has been going on for 18 months in regards to Patriots Elementary. Yes, sir. How about AT Allen? How about long the has same, that been open? About the same time. So another 18 months. Yes, sir. And we still don't know if it's going to be done by June the first. On that project, yes, I'm saying that that particular project will be yes. And Hickory Ridge Middle School, how long has that one been open? Hickory Ridge, approximately a year and a half. Why is it coming to light so late? I mean, we're 18 months down the road. Why is it, why are we so far down the road before we're at a juncture of needing something, extension or things like that? Why is it, why is it taking so long? I, as I say, I think it was an issue of, uh, we, we have several projects that popped up that when I became the director, uh, these projects have been laying um, unattended, if you will, for some time. And in, in the one case, uh, the grant monies that were applied to the project were going to disappear by December 31st. As a result, I had to focus on that, well, actually there were two projects under those grants uh, that uh, required my attention pretty much above and beyond anything else, so we didn't lose the, the monies available to us through the grant programs. There are other similar projects throughout the year that, that we simply had to address on top of these. And um, frankly, because these took some negotiations and took some working with, with local folks to work out the details, um, my focus, I, I couldn't split it up any more than I, I did at the time. And um, I, I think that um, had, if we had to do it over, 
uh, we probably would have gotten started a little bit earlier on some of these projects to really push. But as you know, uh, the real crunch came this last summer when we realized that, that you know, we're, we were getting close to deadlines. But unfortunately, because of the, the need, of the work that, that's placed on us during the summers, you know, we, we do probably uh, at least 50% of our work during a summer period. And that focus of summertime work, plus some of these other projects that were, were left unattended for some time prior to my coming, um, required a lot of t attention to get them done. What are the change orders in regards to the um, electrical connection of the storage building? Yes, sir. Those, those were two projects that, oh, I mean, a project done at each of the middle schools. In the past, our electricians, our staff electricians were allowed to make those connections. The way the code is being applied today and the way the, the rules are being applied today, we can no longer do that. So we had to contract out. We didn't know that until we had bid the project and it was well, under, well nearly complete. And we were told by the inspectors that we had to acquire a contractor to do that work. So what was the, the code changes? Where, who made the code changes? It wasn't a, it wasn't a code change more, more than it just an application, I believe. We have licensed electricians on our, on our staff. So why can't the licensed electricians on staff do it and save $4,075 on one project and about $1,500 on another? It, it has to do, I'm told, with, with the, the state um, I just lost the term. Uh, it's it's uh, the organizations that, that orchestrate the licensure. Yes, of, the Department of Insurance. Thank you, Department of Insurance. And um, the requirement is, is that the um, uh, people who, who do the work, uh, in the case of our electricians, would have to submit their license in order to do that work. And, um, and in addition, take on the responsibility from a standpoint of insurance, much like a contractor would. And at this point, they're not, they're not really, um, I don't know what the right word is, benefited in some way to do that. In other words, we, we typically don't do a lot of new construction with our staff. We do a lot of maintenance work. This being new construction is a little bit out of the realm of the things we normally do. And as such, I believe it's really more of interpretation than anything else. Okay. all the questions I have. Any other questions? So what, what would be the consequences of not extending the deadline if we, just so that's understood? Well, some of the projects just wouldn't get done. Right. Uh, others, there's some uh, easements that they're in the process of negotiating. Those have to be done. Uh, it's, it's just taking some of those are beyond their control. But some of the other projects, such as the playground canopies and a couple of other things, they just wouldn't get done. Uh, they would have to uh, search for funding of those projects in their in their current expense in the next coming budget. So then the funding that was set for those projects, where will that? that that's part of the COPS program, right. and then that would go back and then be applied to, to debt service. Right, so go back to the county to get If we agree to do them. Right. But the funding is available now for these projects. There, there's currently funding left in those projects to, in order to do those. So there's no new money. It's just... As, as uh, uh, Mr. White was asking, it, it's taken a, quite a while, and typically we don't keep these projects open this long, and we've had a couple of agreements where the, the, that we would extend them open a little longer to finish the projects, but this, it's gone on for quite a while now, and we wanted to bring it to your attention and then make sure that you were okay with extending it another three, three to four months. All these projects have eventually got to be done, though, don't they? I mean, that's, basically, that's what uh, they the, need to uh, be done. Hmm. The, the school system has proposed. They would like these projects to be done. Some of them, like again, with the the acquiring the right of ways and the easements, those have to be done just simply so that they could uh, own the properties where the utility lines are going through and where road widenings are taking turn lanes are being right. installed. The others are, are optional, but as Mr. Wiki said, you know, some of the playground canopies would, would are making the, the playgrounds a little more safer, just keeping the heat off of them, but. They're projects that have been going on for a while, and that's why we wanted to bring them to your attention uh, to make sure you are aware that these these projects are still staying open in excess of 18 months, and, and wanted to make sure you were aware of that and you were okay with extending them out a little bit farther. On a similar note, I, I, I have a similar question, but 
where are we in regards to the restrooms out at um, Rocky River? Because we've been trying to deal with that for a good 18 months now. Are we stalled on that? So Mr. Wiki can answer that question for you. <laughs> we stalled on that, Mr. Wiki. <laughs> we are from the standpoint of um, a permanent solution. We, uh, the likelihood of us um, building something that would suit the entire needs uh, at this point, we, we're not able to fund that at this point in time. We have uh, worked with the uh, Parks uh, Department to modify one of the existing buildings and increase the number of um, stalls, in, in bathroom stalls in that building, but it won't be adequate to address the full-time need during a tournament. Okay. Uh, the Parks Department is aware of that and are, are, have indicated a willingness to, to rent a facility. Uh, we, we plan to make uh, available permanent utilities so that a rented facility could be used. Other questions? Um, on the Patriots Elementary School, you've got purchase of land slash Alexander property to be determined? Yes, ma'am. Uh, when will that be determined? Because there isn't a value there for that one. We're, well, we're having a uh, uh, Ferris appraisal look at that right now for us. Um, so as soon as they, they, and I hope that would be in a few weeks, that they will be able to provide us with a value. I'll go back to Mr. F uh, Alexander and negotiate. Uh, I will say, however, that, that he has, uh, and the question came uh, from Mr. White about why things were delayed. I have probably had six to ten different conversations with Mr. Alexander, and the position that he's taken has changed. Uh, we have worked with him to purchase the land. We have worked with him to look at a residential access to Rocky River Road and now we're looking at a larger access to Rocky River Road as an alternative to buying the land. And what I mean by that is that the uh, school district has uh, tried to uh, facilitate an agreement between Mr. Alexander and Wells Fargo to allow some of their land to be used for his purposes of gaining access to Rocky River Road from his farm. And that's part of this discussion. And as Mr. White would most likely know, some of those discussions can take quite a bit of time. So you've asked for a date of, um, or I think it's in here, right, <coughs> June the 1st, or do you feel comfortable that you will have, you would have everything wrapped up by then or before then? Or I, I really believe before then, Madam Chair. It, it's my hope, as I said, the, the uh, Electrical work is is done within the next two weeks. Uh, I'm hoping by the end of this week, but because of weather, it might take a little bit longer. Uh, the, the shelters, the, uh, the sunscreens are on order. They're coming in the first to second week of March. They'll be installed immediately thereafter. I mean, the majority of this work will go forward. It's these negotiations and working out the details of some of the, the, the piece with uh, Mr. Alexander the uh, and the um, Lost any nuisance uh, that may take a, take that period of time to get resolved. Uh, it, it's uh, certainly not something I want to go any further than that. Um, this is an item that that we would will be placing on the agenda for our next meeting. Um, we have it under consent right now. Um, what's the pleasure of the board is it to go forward and yeah. give them till June the first? I think it needs to be on new business right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not knowing, other? I don't know whether I would agree to consent to it or not. Okay, well that's fine. Yeah. We, can, yeah. we can move that. Are you yeah. going to propose a different date or? Or none at all. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, just yeah. trying to gauge the temperature. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit when we get through the rest of these items then on where you want to put it. Mm -hmm. We can definitely put that under new business. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, next up, we have discussion of options for the Old Bethel School property, and the county manager is going to address that. Yeah, I'm 
<laughs> at, at this time, we, we're, uh, we'd like a little more time. Hopefully, we can have so – we're having some further discussions about um, how we would dispose of the property, and we, uh, before we're ready to make a recommendation, we need a few more, few more weeks, a couple of weeks to have those discussions. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, be ready to go by the work – or by the regular meeting this month, but it, it may even be the work session next month so we can get all the parties together to see if there's another viable option prior to uh, – making a recommendation to demolish. I'd so. make a motion to table this until the work session in March. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Um, just for uh, clarifications, Madam Clerk, um, this was tabled originally, and I don't remember who tabled it originally that needs to take it off the table with Robert's Rules of Order. Do you know, Fanny? I don't recall either at this <laughs> okay. moment. Well, we will go along with the motion to table it until the March work session and, and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Technically, whoever tables it has to take it off the table for discussion. So, but I think we're all in agreement that we need to move forward with it. Um, the next item is cooperative extension, adoption of a countywide farmland protection plan. Jonathan Marshall. And actually, Debbie Bost is going to join me for this, this item in case you have any questions about the plan itself. Well, she's coming up. The debt service for the Lake Howell appeared to have been 190, just over 192000 last year. Um, there just seemed to be one payment this year, so it's, it's only 87000 about half of that. All that, of course, is contemplated in the five-year plans. So as it's gone on, Ms. Dubois has shown those being retired and, and coming out of our obligations. Now, this is this plan the is the agricultural preservation plan was actually or the countywide farmland protection plan was actually part of the adoption of the enhanced and voluntary agricultural district program and, and foresaw the the adoption or, or the completion of this plan it was presented to the board of commissioners as a report um, we found as we've been citing it and need and it needs to be in place for certain applications and reports that it was not adopted by the commissioners so we're actually bringing it back before you for adoption and there's been some question if it would require a public hearing but we think since there is question to that that we'll we'll use our electronic advertising for that purposes and would request that you set a public hearing for your regular meeting and again, if you have specific questions about this plan and, and what's included in it, Ms. Boss could answer those. Are there any questions? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay. We will do that. Okay, the next item, um, Jonathan Marshall again, request for public right-of-way. And actually, I'm going to invite two people to join me for this one. Um, Bill Beringer with the Pfeiffer North Stanley Water Association and Daryl Wagner, who is an engineer. As you may or may not be aware, there is a, a statute in place, um, 153.815, that requires consent of the Board of Commissioners um, in certain counties for other bodies, in this case it says local government, outside the county to own right away within the county. So the Pfeiffer North Stanley Water Association is, is proposing or has proposed to run a water line through the far northeastern part of the county, um, primarily to serve a, a industry that's located in Rowan County, Carolina Staylight, but also the Vulcan Rock Quarry in Cabarrus. Um, as that water line is run, there is the contemplation that it would also um, could also serve some existing dwellings there or some properties there. Um, our zoning ordinance, and again this is, comes into play from some of the long-range planning we've been doing, does not permit uh, governmental water and sewer to be provided to individual lots within those parts of the county unless it's done so for health reasons. And I believe uh, Mr. Wagner can certainly address that issue, but um, typically with those staff would look at that issue and if they could show us some kind of give us some kind of indication of, of the the poor water quality the health issues involved and those those lots and houses could connect to these water lines 
as they contemplate with this construction. But again, Mr. Beringer and Mr. Wagner can give you more details on, on this project and on the water quality. I am Bill Beringer, manager of the system. Um, we're a member-owned nonprofit. Um, the line is about 12,000 feet long. We go from Meissenhammer to Gold Hill. About 6,000 feet of it is through Cabarrus County um, along Glenmore Road. There are about 25 houses along the way that we would like to serve to get to, to those businesses. We are in the process of negotiating a loan with USDA for $390,000. Um, part of the loan package requires your approval. Um, they probably will not approve the package without us being able to serve those people. USDA is much more interested in serving people than businesses. Um, so that's, that's our dilemma. Um, we could probably run that line to those businesses uh, and come out at some point, uh, but the USDA loan is much more lucrative than any private loan that we could get, of course. And those people along the way desperately need public water. And, and certainly from the county standpoint, we have a, a very large business or a business of large footprint, although I'm sure not as many employees, but still important, Vulcan Rock Quarry. Um, Carolina Stalite is located there because the particular stone, if you're not familiar with it, that they mine in the northeast part of the, the county has a property that when it's fired in a kiln has the same properties as standard aggregate, but at a lighter weight. So it's fairly unique and, and they're able to use it in things like um, bridges that have a long span where, where cutting down on weight even negligibly is very important so this material is actually shipped um, both nationally and internationally from that area so there are some unique employers in that area because of the the assets and and so from our standpoint the water supply to the to those businesses would be important the use of the water is primarily for air quality uh, right now they're having to ship that water in from granite quarry in trucks um, to uh, about a half million gallons a month. Um, they mix that water with, and form a lime slurry and it goes into those kills and it suppresses the um, hydrogen sulfide emissions. Uh, Vulcan wants to use the water for dust suppression. And they do have about 65 employees between those two plants up there. <clears throat> How many residences <clears throat> could possibly tie in? Um, 25. Do you know what the tap-on fee will be that they have to pay, or will that be part of this? That yes, the, they will have to pay a tap fee. You don't know what that is yet? $800. $800. For a three-quarter tap. Okay. It's a bargain. That is a bargain. <laughs> You're correct. We're a nonprofit. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, and my reason for asking that is that, you know, there have been other places where lines are run and the tap fee is so high that unless, you know, the well fails, they can't afford to pay the tap fee. So that's why I was asking what if it was a, as you said, a bargain, a reasonable fee that the, the homeowners would have to pay. Yeah. Um, I would presume that the businesses would pay, they would need a much larger They would tap. pay a tap fee as well. And their fee would be much larger because they'd have a much larger tap. Yeah, based on what they want, right. what they need. Yeah. And we are not asking Cabarrus County for a dime. Some approval put in there. Questions, commissioners? I guess the question I've got is that it came up, I guess, in here that uh, Jonathan, that that's AO, that area is mm -hmm. that's right. part of the area. It's right agricultural. Now. I know there's some area up there, though, that was looked at for future as possible industrial because of the rail line and because of the location of Vulcan in Carolina. Vulcan right itself is zoned industrially and, and so are the properties surrounding it mm -hmm. so the service to the industries is not an issue at all right. mm -hmm. the, the water service there is, is, is not the issue it's really the lines as they're being run on the other two roads and connection of those houses or, or property within that that would be the bigger issue mm -hmm. there are there are a lot of water quality concerns there. in fact mr. Wagner I believe has an illustration he can provide that shows how, how poor the water quality sure. in that area is mm -hmm. uh, 
I'm Darrell Wagner with Wagner Consulting Engineers. I've been hired by the Pfeiffer North Stanley Water Association to, to do the water design. But uh, it so happens that I live in this area also. Um, I live on Wagner Road and um, we have been having bad water for all of our lives really. And I told my uncle we were going to come here tonight and uh, wanted to get a sample of his water. And he gave me this. He said, I keep this water bottle beside of my table when I'm watching TV. <laughs> this is what the water looks like in that area. Now, when you shake it up, you can see on the bottom it's orange. It settles out. <laughs> That's the iron and calcium that settles out. So when you shake it up, you've got a lot of uh, things floating in there. I don't know if you can see that from here or not. Keep me stone waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has a filter on his water system. And the, the filter doesn't look too bad, but you can see the orange deposits around the top there where the water makes those stains. And everybody in the area has these stains in their toilets and uh, their sinks and their bathtubs. So, yes, I can speak personally to that. Uh, the, the soils in those areas uh, are Meissenhammer classified soils. And the mice and ember soils are shallow to bedrock and are unsuitable for septic tank drain fields. So uh, by providing drinking water, safe drinking water to this area, you're actually improving the quality of life for these people because it's, the soils are bad, the, the, the sewage can come to the surface, it can get into wells. So you're absolutely improving the quality of life for these people, for these residents by providing them safe drinking water. And you do not have to worry about a high density population developing from this water system, I, I can assure you. <laughs> and we do not intend and do not wish to, to put laterals on that line and, you know, to extend out to the general population there at all. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's see. We don't. For that one, it's a consent item. We don't need to do any kind of public hearing or anything. It's just a consent, right? Okay. Um, the next one is uh, David Hampton's here. EMS, approval of ambulance piggyback purchase and related budget amendments. Hi. I'm here to request your approval to purchase three ambulances. Uh, the reason we're asking at this point is to try to beat a new regulation that's going to be put in place after June, that's going to add an additional anywhere from seven to eleven thousand dollars per unit. Uh, it's going to be a substantial increase uh, in the cost of the units, and this is because of a new standard that obviously is being put in or being put in by NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. Uh, up until this point, these standards had been governed by the General Service Administration, and uh, up until 2008. They were handling it, and they said in 2008 they didn't want to handle it anymore, and they turned it over to the NFPA. Because of these new standards, there's obviously going to be a substantial increase in the cost of the units right off the top. So we're looking at a savings, if we purchase now, of about $30,000. Questions? Do we have the money? The, the budget amendment is attached. It would come out of fund balance. Okay. So we're, we're, everything's correct, everything's good on that, and we're going to still come under budget this year as anticipated, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I have no other questions. Thank you. What are the new standards that are raising the cost? There are several, and I can actually I can make you a copy of it, but they're talking about governors, different seat standards for the weight of the seats. Um, basically, the NFPA obviously deals with fire apparatus, and so some of the apparatus requirements for fire engines and fire apparatus is going to be transferred over to ambulances, which is obviously going to make them a little bit safer, but it's also going to increase the cost. Right. Okay. And it's just a, a basically the man, ambulance manufacturers are, are saying that we're looking anywhere from seven to, and it depends on where you look, anywhere from seven to eleven, twelve thousand dollars per truck to meet these standards. If if they if they're not approved, if you guys don't approve to go this route. Uh, then they would show up in the 2013 budget because they, they are all three of the ambulance that they would be replacing have have reached uh, the point of our policy and in, in, in miles and age so they need to be replaced any other questions no? okay thank you very much thank you 
Uh, the next item uh, from finance, adoption of resolution reducing the salary of the Register of Deeds. <laughs> you can speak to that? Yeah, I can speak to that. Mm -hmm. per, per the statutes, uh, during the year of general election, uh, if, if the vacancy will be uh, for the Register of Deeds and a couple other elected offices, you, the board has the responsibility of setting the salary uh, they can lower the salary, they can raise the salary, but uh, it needs to be in place prior to um, registration uh, or, for, or filing, excuse me, filing of office. So while we're proposing the, the Registered Deeds Office, uh, uh, Ms. McAbee is, is gonna be retiring, uh, therefore the new person would be coming in. Uh, the, current, the current salary, Ms. McAbee's been there 20 years. So what we're proposing is to bring this salary, the starting position back to the starting salary within the classification. I believe that's attached for you. But you have to do that by resolution and that's, what, that's what's before you is to approve that resolution to pull the, uh, the position salary back to the step one level of that position. We do need to suspend the rules for this item um, and go ahead and take care of it today instead of uh, waiting to the uh, regular meeting. Does anybody have any questions about the item? If not, I have a motion to suspend the rules. Second. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Do I have a motion to accept the, to approve the, adopt the resolution uh, reducing the salary of the Register of Deeds? To move. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have uh, Kyle Billifer and Kevin Grant to discuss the um, construction and demolition landfill operation and give us a financial update. Give me a Good afternoon. Hey, can you switch, go to that map right there? I think since our last work session, that we discussed closing the current landfill cell when it fills up in 2013. Um, we've had an inquiry from a citizen about why we were doing that and this person had some landfill knowledge as an engineer and we've met with this person and we've also had Greenway Waste come back and discuss potential submitting a new proposal about continuing on and doing a public-private partnership. Um, when we looked at it, if you look at the, the yellow outlined area, just to the south of our current cell, that's areas phases two through six of possible future expansions. Now, when we originally looked at it last year, we were pretty sure that uh, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources would not give us approval to expand in that area without a liner. Now, we've had a couple people look at that area, look at who have knowledge with groundwater, and we're pretty sure that the state would, would look at it or at least um, be open to exploring that area. Now we've had some conversations with hydrogeologists at Diener um, and based on just the initial re, uh, groundwater results that we send them, um, they're open to looking at some of that area to expanding without a liner. Um, now more testing would need to be done. We'd probably have to drill probably eight to 10 more groundwater monitoring wells. But the initial results, if you look at there just to the south, based on the data that we've given or provided based on the groundwater samples, um, look favorable. Um, now that'd be provided that we pro um, have a 100 foot buffer between the old unit two cell, which is to the right of that area in yellow. Um, which would mean we'd lose some of that expansion area, which instead of about 19 acres, would probably trim it down to potentially 10 to 12 acres. Um, but that is, that is a, a possibility that we can look at it. And then, like I said, Greenway Waste is in the process of submitting a new proposal to us about a possible part, public private partnership, which we have not received from them at this point. Um, so I guess at that point, we really don't have a whole lot more information. We're just kind of looking for some guidance in terms of um, the feasibility of looking to expand to the south of our current cell, provided that we don't need a liner or anything like that. Um, 
like I said, it's still early in, early in the exploratory stage for looking into that. But like I said, we're just kind of looking for some guidance. Questions? How long do you think you need to um, be able to make a determination if we should do something other than close it on or about June 30th, 2013? Well, I'm hoping to see, first of all, from Greenway Waste, I'm hoping to see a proposal from those guys within the next week in terms of if we went on it by on our own. Um, I'm in the process of talking to our consulting engineers, trying to get some prices from those folks. <coughs> I'd like to say March for the, the March meeting, but April might be more <coughs> feasible in making sure that we do this right and get some accurate numbers and be able to put together a presentation for, for you. We have to do testing one way or the other to submit to Diener. They're not going to put anything in writing, and even getting something from verbally is difficult. So either we have to do something or we have to look at the, the proposed agreement we get from <coughs> Greenway and accept them paying to do this to do this work for us or we have to find the money to do it. So th that's kind of some of the guidance we're looking for is do we pursue on our own based on costs or do we wait to get the costs if we were going to do it and then look at the new agreement from Greenway and then get all up with you in the beginning of March or how, how do you want us to proceed in that? Because a decision will need to be made. Yeah, right. You know, as we discussed last month, the, the option, the numbers were coming out that we it was, it was recommended that we look at closing in in June of two, 2013. Uh, with this new information, uh, after we went back and make sure the numbers were correct that that we were presenting, uh, with some other uh, potential uh, information that we had and in some contacts with the state, it, it may be uh, feasible for us to continue to operate it and expand. Uh, and, and extend the life of the facility. Um, one way is for us to uh, operate it ourselves. The other is, again, uh, entertain a, a private company's um, proposal, excuse me, for <laughs> proposal to, to operate it as well. So we don't have those numbers ready yet. So if, if, if your opinion is, no, let's go ahead and, and look at closing in 2013, we can do that this month or, or, or the work session in, in March. If you want us to consider and bring those uh, uh, findings back to you uh, to continue operating, um, Kevin, I'm not sure what, if, if we extend it out, how many years would that add to it if we went through the proposal? It all depends on the amount of property that, that Diener would grant us. Like I said, the, the current area that you see in yellow is 19 acres and that would probably give us about 20, year, 20 additional years of airspace at our current tonnages and density and everything else. Um, if you cut that in half, so you're talking 10 years, 10 years. but that's just, that's just a guess in terms of what they possibly could give us. So that, that's what we're looking at from the staff side. Do, you know, we can continue to get these numbers. If we look at it, that the county is going to operate it, then we are going to have to absorb some cost on some engine to gather some more uh, engineering data uh, so that we can take that to the state just to get an answer of whether or not it can be used or extended with a with an unlined uh, fill area, or we can we can bring you back the proposal from the private uh, entity, uh, and part of their proposal would be that they would pay for that that upfront engineering cost. Uh, so we're we're asking for some directions on, on that, whether we go ahead and move forward with closing in 013 or consider. Uh, the other two options that we we operate or or consider the proposals from a private entity what's the cost to put a liner in it anybody know you're probably gonna and i'm just throwing out a ballpark figure if you put a liner down there on that whole site would be two to three million dollars at least plus not only a liner but you would need a leachate collection tank to capture <coughs> all the water or what they call leachate that comes in contact with the waste and then you'd have to pump that send it to a treatment facility and that tank also needs to be specially coated it can't just well be I mean what happens if, if you if you use it without a line or ten years down the road uh, and everything within a mile of there is contaminated and polluted who's gonna pay for all that well, the, the one thing before they would grant us any permit to do an online expansion you would have to create monitoring what they call monitoring abil ability right. or putting groundwater monitoring wells around there so 
the minute you'd see some sort of tick, then you shut it down. You'd have to shut it down or do remediation. Um, yeah, they wouldn't. They would not allow us to go further without that. And that's also why they need to create that 100-foot buffer between that old unit two and the current expansion um, site would be to make sure that you know exactly what's going on in that expansion site. But with the liner, you don't need the groundwater weld. Or do that's you? correct, but they may also ask for that as well because, I mean, we currently <coughs> in, in that old phase that we looked at doing the piggyback expansion, they were also looking at monitoring wells. So you'd probably need both. What has changed their mind at Greenway Solutions to submit a proposal? Because, I mean, this board, board uh, you know, voted on the memorandum of understanding. They were all in agreement, and then they backed out. So what's changed their mind to come back? I think the, from, from my correspondence with them was the fact that they saw that we were planning on closing in 2013, and they just wanted to see if they could extend the life of this landfill because when they looked at it, they believed that there's some life left out there, and um, you, you really don't want to leave any potential C&D landfill land out there because you will not be able to get any virgin land out there in the future. I think that's kind of what they were looking at. What was their reasoning for backing out? Well, the, I think we discussed that in the last work session was the idea of a profit sharing um, that we proposed to them. And they kind of backed off on that, saying that there was a lot of money that they wanted to put up front that they felt was, was, was good enough and a pretty good um, contribution. And then I believe there was, there was something else that's escaping my memory at this point um, that kind of held back on it. I think a lot of it was looking into if they did a compost facility in terms of the county enacting an ordinance that would divert food waste to them. That at the time, I didn't think we were able to do that. Also, uh, after you know uh, the board passed memorandum of understanding, did the county do anything further at that point um, to you know prep the site, or w what was done after that? Was there any preparations made? We had further discussions with Greenway in terms of finalizing that memorandum of understanding, and that's when kind of the issues came up. As, as we were proceeding that with the profit sharing issue was the one big stumbling block okay. that we tried to keep pushing and they kind of backed off and said so that that would be a deal breaker. No work was done, no physical work. Well, at the same time though, as we were doing this, we were doing that expansion because I think I mentioned at the last work session as well that the current cell was rapidly running out of airspace and we really need to do that permit extension that we just, that we currently just got done with construction and actually started uh, placing waste November 1st and that's kind of the same token or the same idea was to expand that section to buy us some time so we could kind of look into the southern section to see if we could expand without a liner okay how, mu how much did that cost we did that with all within this year's operating budget it was probably less than a hundred thousand dollars to do that we did it all with county employees and we did rent some construction equipment that we did not have Any other questions? I, mean, I think it's worth tabling it until or having you give us an update in March and then plan for you to be on the agenda in hopefully in April for action. Um, I mean, I'd like to know what the dollar amounts are before you spend anything. If it seems like it's something worth doing, um, then we can go forward. I had a preview, the, the, the um, resident, I guess, it's a previous customer of mine, saw in the paper called um, hadn't talked to him in at least five years and um, uh, anyway he lives in town that's what he's done for a living so he was kind enough to come in and sit down and I know at least twice I don't know if it's been more than that for free and he has knowledge so I mean he has a, he's an expert in the area and it was nice to have somebody you know offer to come in and sit down with some staff members and give some other ideas on what might happen with it. So that's yeah. kind of how that connection. Yeah, we also through. gave him a tour of the landfill site to show where the new expansion area was going to be at. And we actually showed him some additional data <clears throat> in terms of groundwater flow that kind of led him to believe that there was a possibility that we could expand in this area without the need of a liner. We, we can uh, receive the proposal, see if the numbers match with, with the private company paying those uh, those upfront costs. Um, if it looks like the numbers will work, 
we'll, we, we can bring those back to you. If they look like they're not going to work, we can also bring you back what it would cost the county to, to do that work themselves and see if you agree to, to move forward with that. So I think we can have those numbers by March. We're going to try to. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll put that on the March agenda, work session agenda, and then, of course, if anything happens between now and then, you can let us know. Right. Thank you. Um, next, we have Parks. Uh, Londa Strong requests to change the current Parks holiday schedule. Good afternoon. Um, the agenda item we, that you have before you is a recommendation from our Park Commission. Uh, we had several, quite a few phone calls, emails, and Facebook posts. Because if you remember, the weather was beautiful the fr Friday after Thanksgiving, and people wanted to get into their parks. Well, the parks currently are only closed five days out of the year. And listed there, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Thanksgiving, day after Thanksgiving, and New Year's Day. They're open all the rest of the time. So we sat down with the staff and reviewed this, looked at it, and everyone kind of came up with the consensus that Okay, Friday after Thanksgiving is probably a good day to be open the majority of the time. And we looked at ways that how we would staff it. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a part-time ranger there for all eight hours at each of the parks. We could use one and go around. But if for some reason it was as pretty again as it was this past year, uh, it would only cost $438. And we felt like with the hours that we have with people being out sick or um, vacant positions that we could absorb that $438 if in fact the board wanted to move forward with this. So that's where where we are with the recommendation to you all to look at changing the current holiday schedule just for the parks. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, Susie Morris is here to talk about uh, Cabarrus County School Site Guidelines. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you uh, this evening the Cabarrus County School Site Guidelines. Um, several of you were involved in the Harrisburg Area Land Use Plan process. This document did come out of a separate process uh, that was done in conjunction with that process to look at how schools were planned for, um, how sites were picked for those schools, and then also to look at how the actual site itself is developed when we get to the point of building the schools. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions you have about the document or give you an overview. Um, it, it's up to you all how, how much you give you us an me. overview. Okay. Um, <coughs> This document actually is based on two documents that the schools use. One is called the North Carolina Public School Facilities Guidelines. Um, that was most recently updated in August of 2010. And then the other one is a, a publication that the Department of Public Instruction put out, which is called the School Site Land for Learning. Um, this document is consistent with both of those documents. It discusses things like site size, um, which there are some guidelines based on how many students are at the school, how large the site should be. It also talks about uh, configuration and using um, cloning when possible, which is something that the county does. Also trying to look at a two-story design instead of a one-story design so that you may not have to use as much property. And also then with co-location and shared facilities. So a lot of these things are things that we are already doing, but it was just trying to get them into a document um, that everybody kind of agreed on, you know, this is what we'll look at moving forward. This is what we've learned from what has happened in the past. Um, it discusses relationships to surrounding areas. So neighborhoods trying to integrate schools into the neighborhoods, also trying to center the schools in the attendance areas if possible. I think with the redistricting, um, that is a little bit um, improved and a little bit better. Um, looking at adopted land use plans and recognizing in those plans and when those plans are updated where schools might be appropriate, potentially looking at uh, sites that could be used in the future. It discusses transportation. Um, any of you that have been to Hickory Ridge Road 
probably know that, that there was definitely a lesson learned there with transportation, with the one way in and one way out, and now we have a middle school there as well. So um, this actually sets up some guidelines and says, you know, hey, we need two entrances, preferably on two different roads, and if we can't find that, then let's get two access points far enough on the same road that hopefully we can handle the traffic. Um, it also talks about utilities and public safety, trying to um, find sites where there are already existing utilities, and then also to make sure that there's a, a good response time as far as fire um, and EMS in case there is some type of an incident at the school. And then as far as the site design, the one thing that is not in this document is how any of the interior design happens. That all is through the school, so this is more related to building placement, access roads, how traffic travels around the site and to the roads next to it. Um, and it also talks a little bit about using green building practices and sustainability um, and when possible pursuing LEED certifications or at least trying to use uh, the design criteria that you would use to get to a LEED certification even if we didn't pursue the certification itself. Um, it also discusses that if you do have a site that has natural features such as wetlands um, or other um, habitats on it to try to design the site so that those could be used for educational purposes and integrated into science classes and then also um, trying to co-locate so that practice fields and um, stadiums can be used by multiple high school and a middle school or the high school band and the middle school um, band or the different um, sports groups. And I am happy to report that these guidelines were adopted uh, by the Cabarrus County Board of Education on January 23rd. They did have some questions as we worked our way through the document. Um, I did work with Mr. Whitkey and we addressed those concerns um, and they adopted. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions, please. No questions? The, the county the county school board they approved it last month so they're on board these these guidelines are somewhat personalized for Cabarrus County Schools mm -hmm. once you guys approve these then then Susie and her staff can go back and, and begin to work on Kannapolis City Schools mm -hmm. set of guidelines as well okay. that was my next question was to ask about Kannapolis City Schools so, okay okay thank you thank you um, next we have Dennis Testerman uh, with the Soil and Water <coughs> Conservation District Farm and Ranch Lands Protection Program application I'm motioning to Ned Hudson who's the Secretary Treasurer on the District Board and Tommy Porter who is an associate on our board to join me in case there are any questions that they might um, could answer uh, we are here as part of a continuing phase of lining up funding for placing a conservation easement on a portion of a farm um, owned and operated by Tommy and Vicki Porter and Tommy's um, dad. Um, when we were before you all last, I think in October, we were at that time talking about um, an award that we had received from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture in the amount of $175,000 from their agriculture, uh, agricultural development and farmland preservation trust fund. Um, from the beginning, the way we had um, planned this um, purchase of a conservation easement, we were gonna seek federal funds through the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Services Farm and Ranch Land Protection program and um, we are at that juncture now we just um, submitted that application recently um, the porters are putting in an in-kind match of $175,000 so we are asking the uh, for federal funds in the amount of $350,000 to um, come out to a total um, budget of $700,000 um, I brought some show and tell just to kind of give you uh, an idea of where we're at on that. So a lot of actions that have been taken by um, 
this and previous Board of Commissioners leads up to this um, application being, I think, a competitive one. We already alluded to that earlier with the discussion about the farm and ranch land, um, sorry, the farmland protection plan for Cabarrus County. So the zoning ordinance that was adopted uh, previously, you see the area in purple, uh, agricultural open, that also came up in the discussion about the, um, the quarry operation up in the northeast corner of the county. The Porters is the red that you can see right below the town of Mount Pleasant. Uh, that's the Porter Farm. Thank you with your able cursor action. Um, they're right on the edge of the agricultural open and um, countryside residential. Okay, we can go on to the next one. Uh, the Porters were early adopters or uh, early participants in the Voluntary Ag District program. They went with the enhanced um, Voluntary Ag District designation, which requires a 10-year commitment on their part. That's actually the sign on their farm. Um, as part of the application, we had to prepare a proximity map. Um, you see the red Porter farm still in, uh, in the center there. Um, the, um, let's see what else we've got on here. There are two blue areas going um, diagonally northeast and coming down to the southwest. Those are both properties that are protected by conservation easements. Um, just to the um, west of the Porter Farm is an area that is in is in the Cabarrus County Natural Heritage Inventory, a series of Swinitz and Sunflower sites that's an endangered species. And the Dutch Buffalo Creek that drains the Porter Farm, um, the proximity to those two uh, natural areas raised the ranking on their application. And this also shows you some other uh, natural heritage areas in the vicinity and as well as the uh, jurisdictions. You'll see the town of Mount Pleasant. Um, this is um, up here and town of Locust here and, and some Midland down here. So. Um, the threat of development is also a factor in that application. Okay, move forward. Uh, this is just another slide showing, this is the Porter Farm with um, chicken houses, hog houses. Um, you see a, a tributary coming to Dutch Buffalo Creek, Dutch Buffalo Creek, and that's the edge of the Swinitz and Sunflower area. So again, the proximity for biodiversity. The board previously, by the way, adopted that natural heritage inventory and helped provide some of the funding for that inventory uh, in the county. This is a close, an aerial photograph showing the farm. Uh, and we're going to, the next one is going to zoom in on this area right here on the eastern side. And there you go. That's the conservation um, easement area and showing the soil types on it. All the soils in this easement are either prime farmland or farmland of statewide significance, which increased the ranking uh, considerably for this application. The State Department and Federal Departments of Agriculture wanted to prioritize the best soils for farmland use. Uh, proudly displayed, um, the Portis were the North Carolina Conservation Farm Family of the Year winner back in 1999. Uh, also the River Friendly Farm sign and their neighboring church uh, that's surrounded by the farm. This is the road leading into the particular parcel that uh, we're proposing to put the conservation easement on. Just gives you some idea of the vista. Uh, the bright lights washed that out a little bit, but uh, just to give you some idea of the history on this, we first applied for state funding back in 2008. You see a younger Jay White standing there, second <laughs> from the right. Uh, Tom Ellis on the very right, who uh, worked with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, in various capacities. Um, moving on to the left, Ned Hudson, uh, who was a chairman at that time and again now our secretary treasurer and um, previous county manager John Day. This was during a site visit from the state folks in response to our 2008 application. We did not have um, enough um, oomph in that application. I think it probably was next in line and they just ran out of money to fund it. So uh, if you can move forward to the next slide. We submitted again in 2010. This was that same site visit. Um, some of the players have changed. Uh, all of our board and staff, board and staff members stand on the left. The porters with their backs to you. Um, Jonathan Marshall and Mike Downs were also there that day, and folks from the Department of Ag just going over that application that we uh, resubmitted. 
Uh, that's even harder to see, but that is one of several um, celebrations of agriculture events that the Porters have hosted on their farm in the summer. Um, most of you have attended one or more of those events. This particular one, I think, was about 2008 when uh, Commissioner of Agriculture Troxler was speaking to the, uh, the group. And there's actually a map behind him showing the um, voluntary ag districts um, farms throughout the county. And just to give you some idea of the partnership on this particular effort, um, we have a memorandum of agreement with the uh, Land Trust for Central North Carolina. Um, they will, in all likelihood, be a contingent um, grantee on the conservation easement um, if it goes through. Um, they provide a lot of assistance to us and, and actually helped us prioritize this application uh, for submission. Uh, the district, the state trust fund, NRCS, which is the applications before you today, and the Natural Heritage uh, Program here in North Carolina. I would entertain any questions if you might have any for either me or these other folks with me. Any questions? I think it's a very good, admirable project to go forward with. I appreciate you being a forward visionary on this, Mr. Porter. And Mr. Testman and uh, Mr. Hudson and, and getting this thing done. I think it's a great opportunity for our community. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Yeah. Appreciate that. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. We'll keep you posted. Okay, great. Um, next item, uh, we did not cover legislative goals at our retreat. And so we have that next and the county manager is going to go over that with us. Uh, I've included in your packets that went out uh, typically in the past we've, we've the boards pretty much adopted what the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners had put up uh, we've also included in your packet uh, the National Association of Counties um, and some other additional um, recommendations from our staff what if you've re had a chance to review those what we'd like to do tonight is just take some recommendations if you've had any questions on any or if you'd like us to do any further research to sort of explain what those are and then we've got that set up as a new business item to talk about at your regular meeting so if you've got some uh, some of those goals or of those associations or organizations that you would like us to research a little further we can do that in the next two weeks and have that ready for you or we can just discuss these in general at your regular meeting um, yeah, I always have been in the opinion that we don't need to um, inundate our representatives with five, six pages worth of goals because, you know, you know, it's very nice of them to say they're going to read them. They're not going to read five pages of goals if they're single spaced. Um, I think that our, if our board's going to adopt any goals, legislative goals, it ought to be a top five list and or top 10 um, whatever the number is but have it very short and right right directly to the point uh, the things that are most affecting us are um, funding for schools and I think that you know one of the top goals ought to be is go back to what the lottery was supposed to be and that's supposed to be help in regards to capital funding projects not um, fund the state budget uh, and I think we're down to it was down to about 30 percent 30 cents on the dollar uh, is is coming back to the counties um, and even that is suspect as whether or not we get to keep it because um, Governor Purdue um, froze and actually took some of those funds back if I remember two years ago in 2010 so I you know I always I think that's I think that's not that should be one of the top ones I think it's very important that um, we work in conjunction with our Board of a uh, Elections to have larger voting districts to cut down our expenses uh, and of having multiple districts open. Uh, this is not in any way, shape, or form doing away with early voting. Um, what I'm saying is during the, on the day election day is to have a little bit more major districts uh, and, or major areas that we can, uh, we can do. Um, I also would like for, I think our board needs to look at um, pushing our state representatives to um, adopt or seek legislation for pilot um, payment in lieu of taxes, P-I-L-O-T. Um, we've got, you know, there, there is a nonprofit organization that uh, is in Cabarrus County 
that made about $23 million last year that doesn't pay a dime in taxes. And, excuse me, they, it's not supposed to be considered profit. It's revenues over expenses. <laughs> um, that, you know, is, is that takes up a lot. Um, and I think that more information in regards to sales tax re referent, uh, refunds need to be provided to counties that are trying, that are seeking that information. It shouldn't be, um, certainly should be confidential if it's provided to the county, but the county should be able to un be able to understand better what those sales tax um, refunds are being asked of so we can make a determination is that a proper it was it delivered in this county or was it received in this county and used in this county those are just some of the things that I think I think it's it's also uh, imperative that we that if we're going you know the motor vehicle registration and property tax collection can sort of somewhat go hand in hand uh, and in conjunction with that I'm being facetious but since the uh, state requires the health alliance to inspect new restaurants and then they take the fees for that inspection the health alliance isn't allowed to keep them then we certainly can charge a collection fee on the motor vehicle registration that's what i have <laughs> i think the motor vehicle taxes are supposed to go to where when you renew your license they would actually be collecting it and then sending it back to the county. Isn't that the proposal? The, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, it was. It's been extended out. I guess uh, if we can get, uh, if you'd like, we can have uh, Mr. Wiesner to talk to you guys at your March work session to give you an update on that. But I just think it needs to be streamlined in, in one way or the other. Okay. Any other comments? Just, just to get some insight for everybody, the, uh, I know the legislative goals looking at here adopted last year they do it every two years so coming up sometime in the early fall there's steering committees and certainly any commissioner wants to serve on one can serve on one and uh, on these different topics and they gather together and then solicit goals additional goals and it goes through the kind of through a wicket all the way through November when the uh, legislative goals committee meets in Raleigh and then January is when they have the legislative goals conference that will adopt new legislative goals. But I can tell you though that uh, a couple of hot things. One of them is fracking, mm -hmm. and I don't know whether we have any potential here for for fracking or not in this county. Uh, but it's been pretty controversial because of the potential for groundwater contamination. But also on the other hand, it also is turning into a tremendous uh, economic boon for several states that are allowing it and um, that uh, there's been some discussion going on there uh, at, in Raleigh of the whole issue. Um, but also, the if it, earlier we had a presentation from PBH. One of the things that's made PBH so successful has been their ability to use the 1915 waiver, Medicaid waiver. And what that does is it eliminates, it, it changes funding from coming down in stovepipes where it's very restricted and it's controlled pretty much by administrators, bureaucratic administrators in Raleigh and Washington to come down and allow the local entity to, to pull that money and use it how they best see fit to use it. And it's resulted in a tremendous amount of savings of public dollars and uh, actually an improvement in services to the target populations. So I think that something if we push in more and more to get, provide more flexibility to local governments and counties to manage their, their public dollars and human services dollars. Not just, you know, I think we're already working towards consolidation if we want to of human services, but remove those silos on funding, on the funding streams. Mr. Burr, Jeremy Smart, do you have anything to add? We need to stop all the unfunded mandates. <laughs> <Metal -land laughs> state. I think it's number one goal every time. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with everything that's been said. I think uh, you know we we go through this every year. I, uh, you know, I, I would think that the state legislators, well, maybe our state legislators understand, you know, a lot of these, and um, so it's. I know this is a formality, but I agree with 
everything that's been said. So. They don't understand it when they have to balance their budget. Yeah. <laughs> um, when, when is there a deadline on when we need to kind of have this? Or there's one thing with NACO, they wanted goals from us on the national level. I don't remember. Yeah, they requested. Kay, you remember what that date was? Yeah, I think yeah, I think it was in the next week or so. So we wouldn't be able to meet their deadline if we waited to the work session, but that's that's okay. Uh, we can still send them in uh, late. So what I can do is take those suggestions. Uh, if you have any more in the next couple of days, feel free to give me a call. We'll write those up, put them in a list so that you can and, and kick them back out to you guys for your review as, as far as the wording. And, and then we'll have them on new business at the uh, regular meeting for you guys to formally uh, adopt and, and direct us to send on to the appropriate location. Okay. okay, the next item is for us to look at the agenda for the regular meeting and uh, put the page in your handout. And let's just go over that and make sure that we have things where you want them to be. Um, if you would go to the consent agenda, okay, item number one, we will move that to um, new business. New business, and we'll call that number four. Which one is that? In new business. Number one. Number one. Item number one under consent: the cooperative extension adoption of countywide farmland protection plan. Uh -huh. We will move that to um, item number four. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I'm getting my numbers Should backwards. Be three. Item three. Well, let's put <laughs> it at number one. Sorry, that's the one that needs a public hearing, right? Right. Yes. So we typically do public hearings right at the beginning. So, sorry, I drew my lines the wrong way. If we'll make that one cooperative extension and call for the public hearing is item number one under new business, that would take the planning soil and water conservation to number two, legislative goals to number three, and then number four would be Cabarrus County Schools request for extension of deadline for funding several projects. Make that one um, item number four under new business. Is there anything else on the consent agenda that you either have a question about or that you won't move to new business? We would, uh, I think we talked about number 13 and our consent should be removed from the agenda right. completely. We're going to table number 13 mm -hmm. to the March. Hmm. And number 12 <laughs> will be tabled to, uh, we'll table it to March or March, to April? March, March work sessions, fine. So 12 and 13 will be tabled to the March work sessions. Anything else under consent that needs to be moved to new business? Okay. Um, Madam Chair, underneath appointments to boards and committees, under the item number four, uh, notice that's removal uh, under the appointments to appointment to PBH board. There, we are reducing by one a member. Um, that. Is, and so when the member comes off this time, her term, her second term is up, so there will not be a replacement name for her. The second thing that's happened, though, is that Tana Hartzell, who is a member of the board, has tendered her resignation from the PBH board uh, due to just conflicts in her personal schedule and personal obligations. Um, I'm going to recommend to this board that we not fill that. We hold off on filling that until we, the board governance is straightened out for, for PBH. So it'll just be myself and uh, Betty Babb will be the only representatives on the PBH board short term okay if there's no other changes on the agenda at this time I would accept a motion that we approve the agenda for the regular meeting so all those in favor say aye aye any opposed okay and then, <laughs> and then uh, the next item is a departmental overview transportation department are you gonna yeah why, why they why they're all walking up uh, per our discussions uh, last weekend at the retreat uh, you you had uh, requested that we we start bringing in some some departments and looking at their mandated or first of all look at an overview of what their services are and then what what parts of those services uh, are mandated and, and non-mandated uh, so I, I requested that uh, Randy Bass and his staff and Ben's joining them as well from transportation again uh, to talk a little bit about their programs 
uh, and then also some of their funding sources all the way down to how much of it is is matched or, or provided by county funds uh, transportation we'll talk tonight in in March uh, the Department of Aging and the Department of Social Services will talk about their programs as well those are the three largest programs who receive state and federal funding there are some others that so that after we take those presentations to you then we'll 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 take some recommendations as to other departments that you want to hear from at this point in in the budget process so we'll turn it over well thank you thank you all for letting us come today to present uh, information regarding our transportation services um, I've been working now with Randy since last October as we've been transitioning to the human services model and I've learned a lot myself in the past four months regarding transportation and what it does for our community and I think one thing you you definitely will find is whenever you do a community assessment or community survey one of the things that floats to the top is uh, is an important need is transportation and that's due of course to a lot of barriers that exist out there for citizens to access services uh, whether it be through the inability to drive economic disadvantages or so forth there's a lot of barriers to transportation so it's always one issue that really comes to the top as a, as a need when a, a community is defined their their basic needs we um, have really worked hard to uh, provide efficient services in the transportation department you'll find as Randy go and Randy and Bob given in, get into some of the specific services the the services they provide are usually tied to a very specific population and a, and a specific type of service and it's usually tied to some type of funding uh, the funding is never enough to meet the, the needs and I'm sure they'll be able to tell you about the unmet needs we have as well too but it's usually related to some type of medical employment or well-being need that uh, citizens cannot access without without the transportation department so we will hopefully be able to provide you that oversight and give you a little feel for the funding the services and and what we what they do on a day in and day out basis as well so again we appreciate the time I think you know there's a it's definitely been a historical function of local government to provide transportation services to citizens that have those barriers I think that tradition goes back well over a hundred years starting everything from city buses and and growing from there so it's definitely been a historical function and I think you'll see uh, they'll be able to provide you a lot of information regarding that and what they do day in and day out so I'm gonna let Randy kind of give you the a brief overview and then of course we'll be happy to entertain any questions well thank you um, as Ben said, it, it is a, it's a pleasure to be able to come this evening to, to kind of tell you some of the things that we've been doing and, and the things that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, Cabarrus County Transportation Services does provide a critical link to needed services for the citizens of Cabarrus County. The department provides essential transportation services to the elderly, disabled, medically fragile, and low-income to help connect them with both services and opportunity. Citizens that utilize these services often face barriers such as lack of social support to transportation and depend on the public transit system to meet their needs. Through transportation, we're able to link patients to life-saving medical services such as dialysis, chemotherapy, surgery, and chronic illness management, link elderly and disabled citizens to nutritional sites that help provide needed meals to those who may not be able to get these meals at home, low-income working individuals and families to employment that help them maintain their household and well-being for their families link citizens to educational and vocational training that enhance their employability skills and lead to productive citizenship within the community and increase the standard of living and also link it risk citizens to services that help promote stability in the home and prevent institutional placement CCTS through its services promotes the overall health independence and enjoyability and economic well-being of citizens that may not have access without transportation. Public transportation has been a vital service for this community for more than 100 years to help links critical services to the citizens. Without public transportation, many users may not be able to access life-sustaining services that promote health and their well-being. Since 2008, CCTS has taken a number of measures to help reduce the cost of services. We've placed a freeze on senior transportation to mill sites, which has created a waiting list which currently have 60 uh, individuals on it. We've eliminated out-of-county trips for seniors. We've eliminated all non-essential non senior trips. We've also placed a freeze on the RGP program, and we have a waiting list of over 40 individuals for that program. We've created a partnership with the Rowan County, utilizing the Rowan Express service that they have, 
which helps take veterans and the general public for services in Salisbury. And we've also uh, had a reduction in force as well. CCTS provides these services through a variety of funding sources that are supported by federal, state, and county dollars. The department leverages funding based on specific needs and provides these services to, be identif to the identified population. Funding sources often identify the population to be served and the needs to be met. Now the services including in this, uh, beginning with our DSS department, which is Medicaid, and we're estimating that this year uh, we'll be uh, having 41,869 trips, and uh, this is a mandated service, and there's no grant, but it is reimbur reimbursable from the state at 100%. We also have our EDTAP program, which is the elderly and handicap, and uh, this is for medical and elderly handicapped individuals. Uh, we're estimating this year to have 2,418 trips. This is covered under the ROPE program, and uh, this is a non-mandated service. We have the employment component of it where we're looking at estimating 11,522 trips this year. They're again under the ROPE program. Uh, this is also a non-mandated service. We have the Rural General Public, or RGP as we call it. We're estimating that there are 7,724 trips this year. Now the RGP program does collect a fare. The commissioner set the fare when we established this program uh, at $3 per trip and we do collect those fares and those fares uh, do tie in to cover the match component under one of the grant programs. So it's sort of a self-funding process. We also have an ADA which is the Americans with Disabilities Act and this is provided in under contract to the CK Rider Service here in Concord where we take care of those trips for them and we're estimating that there will be 2,436 trips there. We also do the Department of Aging, which includes medical, quality of life, and the meal sites. Uh, we are looking at 19,000 trips this year, and the funding for that under the block grant ran out in October of last year, and the county has been funding that until July. Uh, that comes again, as I mentioned, from the HCCGB Aging Grant, and that, that is a non-mandated service. Cabarrus Links is our jobs program, work and job training and related trips. That's been very successful for us. Uh, ridership on that continues to grow. Uh, we're estimating 20,262 trips this year under the, JARC, under the JARC program. The funding to moving forward on that, we get some uh, variety of funding. The 5311 grant or the CTP grant is an, an expen administrative expense, salaries and benefits for the director, coordinator, administrative assistant, drug testing, janitorial supplies, uniforms, office supplies, Travel and training, cell phones, building rentals, utilities, printing and binding, copier and softwares. Uh, this past grant was $322,374,000. Uh, they did have a county match of $52,792, which was 15%. Uh, uh, the ROPE grant covers the trips for RGP, for EDTAP, and employment trips. Uh, the grant was $192,950. Three dollars and nine thousand two hundred seven of that was uh, part of the overall uh, county match, but ten percent of the RGP funding again comes from the employment trips. The HCCGB, which comes under the Department of Aging, it covers trips for the Department of Aging, and we're looking at one hundred fifteen thousand six hundred seventy-two dollars in that grant. And uh, that does have a 10% county match and it's awarded to the Department of Aging who in turn gives a portion of the grant to transportation to the amount of $101,000. The mission of our department is to provide transportation services that enable all individuals the opportunity to access necessary medical care and other resources that can improve and enhance their independence. By providing safe transportation, we promote an independent lifestyle that allows individuals to live a full quality of life. Our mission speaks directly to the goals of the commissioners to preserve and enhance the quality of life by addressing growth with sound public policies that sustain resources, provide high quality services, and fund infrastructure needs. We feel that our program speaks to that goal. Our employees are regulated by both federal and state guidelines, which include random drug testing, yearly training in CPR, first aid, bloodborne pathogens, defensive driving, customer service, and passenger securement. We also follow strict maintenance regulations that are mandated by state guidelines, and we follow these guidelines so that our vehicles are in the safest operating condition possible each and every day of service. 
All of our employees take pride in providing these services to Cabarrus County residents, and they truly feel that they make a difference in someone's life every day. And that's I have my printed statement, so at this point, we will be more than happy to open it up for any questions or comments. I guess just to add to that, as you can see, the, the, our transportation department is providing services or, creating, or providing transportation opportunities for clients who, of DSS and, and the Department of Aging. The, the one program that is mandated is 100% funded by the federal government. We are currently doing that with taxis, uh, where Randy and his staff now are looking to even try to streamline that process by doing that in-house with our staff, and therefore the requirement to draw down less money from the federal government and still provide the service in-house. So we're going to be coming to you th with that uh, fairly soon as well. So, so not only are they trying to work efficiently with the money they have, they're also trying to work a little bit more efficiently without even having to pull down as much federal money as well. So that uh, so that, that part of it won't be needed as well. The other programs that are not mandated, those are services that are, are as you can see, they have a lot of clients. Uh, there's waiting lists in some of those programs. And we and you as a board are, are able to provide that service with only 10% of the cost coming from, from the county funds. So just wanted to throw that out there. And, and then all three of these gentlemen here are available for your questions for their daily operations, funding, and, and, and what the future that they're looking at as well as far as the service is concerned. The um, question, the, the dialysis trips, what does that fall under? Does that fall under the Department of Aging Grant or is that well, underneath the? Uh, it actually falls under all, 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 of, all of them. Uh, okay. We have it broken out. Dialysis, which is one of the most critical life-sustaining components of our service, we, we have different resources that we pull down to help provide those trips to uh, to those customers. And that's the that's the trips, those trips, the ones where your drivers are at the highest risk because that has to be done rain, snow, sleet, or shine? Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, um, during uh, severe weather events, uh, we have a plan in place to where we have, actually if it snows, we have chains that we put on our vehicles so that we can make those trips that is the one thing that we will always accomplish is make sure those patients get to the dialysis treatments and, and one to follow up on that too having worked in with dialysis patients in the past and having a spouse who works with them every day those dialysis patients that rely on transportation you do not want them driving after dialysis their 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 vision is blurred their bodies are weak and they the ones that are utilizing the system, whether they're Medicaid or using it through the elderly and disabled because they, they don't qualify for Medicaid, they're, they're pretty reliant on it most likely because they don't have a family member who can take them during the day or something. So they do rely on that transportation and we don't want them driving, that's for sure, after dialysis. It's a grueling experience on your body. We, we've taken a number of measures over the past couple of years in, in terms of technology to help improve our service. We've uh, put in a route match software system that helps better utilize the resources we have. Uh, we just installed the AVLs and MDTs, which are uh, help us keep up with the, where the vehicle location is in is, is any given time, and it's real-time information. Uh, and we are now looking with uh, to the state, and we just sent the information over to IT today to look at them helping fund or funding the installation of cameras on our vehicles, which is a more is a, a, a great tool to help us uh, look at accidents and, and things. And we, we take safety very seriously. Safety is our number one priority. Uh, and we have taken the challenge on to create one of the safest uh, systems in the state. And I will say that a lot of the things that we've been working on uh, with our DSS partners have been uh, utilized across the state of North Carolina. Our, our operation is viewed as one of the better ones in the state. And uh, we have worked closely with them to help implement policy changes at the state level to implement those things that we were doing here. They thought it was a best practice and have taken that and incorporated it into some of the state planning as well. I had a question. What is a, is a trip a one way? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Okay, so if you have, do are most of your trips pick up and drop off and then also the return back or most of your trips one part of the leg or? It depends on how we schedule it. Uh, we look at 
taking a passenger from picking up their home, taking them to the destination. From that destination, we would then go get the next person and take them on to, to that. And that's, what, that's one of the wonderful things about our software is it now helps us schedule those more efficiently where we can maybe pick up multiple passengers in close proximity to each other so that vehicle is traveling with two or three passengers on there versus at a time when we only had one passenger on there. So we're actually operating more efficiently than we have been in the past. And so the, that's the same for the the Cabarrus links. You know, it says 20,000 trips, but that's because I know it runs on the route. So That's a very good question. Uh, actually, those are, those are actual riderships. Uh, we're running that route, and we're picking up those passengers at specific stops along the way. Okay. And then taking them so they interconnect with the CK rider service at the hub, which is allowing those individuals to transfer from our vehicle to their vehicle, and they can then travel on the link, uh, excuse me, the CK rider service to additional resources in, in their service area. Okay. And so if they make a return trip, that counts as two trips. That is correct. Okay. Yes, sir. And then the, I noticed, um, the first um, the first grant you have the, the administrative expenses whenever their department moves um, up to Kannapolis uh, will that rent money be taken out of that budget but whenever whenever their <coughs> department moves with the Department of Social Services is it gonna will that rent money be taken out of that budget that that's uh, that's correct it may be an option that we can still claim some of that based on the new space uh okay. but it just depends on whether or not it's uh, equal it's going to depend on how much space they move into up at, in the new human services centers versus what we're paying rent for okay yeah. current location. that 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 funding operates like a lot of ours in social right. services you become familiar with it's basically a a, a grant right. that's given to the to the local uh, government and basically it's claimed as it's it's spent it's a reimbursement type grant like a lot of the grants we have in DSS so as long as there's administrative expenses then we can claim for the and get okay. helped up get that revenue to help offset the cost. Okay. I was wondering how that would affect it. Any other questions? Okay for the for the viewing population um, that'll watch this tape delayed um, just a reminder because of the we're starting our budget process earlier and we're trying to look at the different areas that are not mandated or that do not have a mandated level of funding that we have to do so that we will have additional information um, for us to have available during the the budget process as we go through this to um, determine you know what next year's budget will look like and if there are any areas that uh, we feel like we want to you know make suggestions to the staff as far as funding levels go so just to reiterate that with the, with the viewing public that'll look at this later if there, is, there are no other questions then um, well, one, one thing I, I know we've got a couple of emails over the last few days from folks the phone calls have come in and stuff like that and i think that's one thing too the public to understand there is no right now nothing has been targeted to be cut you know, there's been several people, elderly folks, that have contacted us, afraid that their rides are being cut out. There's been no discussion no. I mean, it's just, you know, <laughs> of that at this point. No. <laughs> so. Could you tell your drivers that? Yes. <laughs> They're the ones who are passing the information yes. out to their riders. Now, they were asked some questions about some articles in the paper, and, and so they were curious. And we, we've had our discussion with them about that. Yes, sir. Yeah, we, we also agreed that budget questions will we'll come to the manager's office and we right. will respond to those so okay. I, I did respond to one of one of the individuals this afternoon mm -hmm. and informed her of the process and she was appreciative of knowing that uh, no, no decisions have been made yet <laughs> right <laughs> uh, one of the questions too is on the with the treasure the jar grant I think is where we have the we do the transportation for Rowan location workshop mm -hmm. do they provide an additional person on the van to ride when they go out and pick up passengers or is the driver by themselves on the van with the driver is uh, by themselves on the van and that's one of the things that we train for uh in because that's you know you can yes. have situate passenger situations i understand mm -hmm. i know exactly what you're speaking <laughs> to and we do cover that yes okay. sir mm -hmm. yeah. do you have anything else 
If there's nothing else to for discussion, then um, I accept the motion that we adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> motion and a second and a third. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. <laughs>